Hello, my name is Patrick Moore. I'm Marlisa McLaughlin. Welcome to Health Buzz. Perspectives on natural healing. Our show today is on music as medicine and the power of music to heal. Since the dawn of time, since the dawn of civilization, humankind has used music, song, dance to communicate, to be part of every celebration and to be part of the human condition. Uh, music has played, in essence, a universal language across all tribes, all cultures, all countries in the world. Today, in the, as in the past, it played a very fundamental role in the healing process, but major hospitals across America today are rediscovering the value and the therapeutic application of how music can actually play a major role in a variety of illnesses and diseases. And so we can actually use music as medicine. Music as medicine today. We're seeing it in cancer patients. We're seeing it in ICU units. We're seeing it with Alzheimer's patients. Uh, you know, they're finding that uh, what the ancient Greeks once knew and you know, our ancestors, that music plays such a vital role, you know, in terms of health and our emotional. In the past, you know, naturopathic medicine looked at emotional harmony. It's not, it's body and mind. Modern medicine today has gotten away from sort of that holistic aspect of how you heal and more into pharmaceutical drugs, medicine, chemical stimulations, and surgery. So very innovative practitioners today are finding that there's more to medicine than chemicals and drugs and surgery, that the inner sense of healing within, the emotions, the mind, and everything put together plays such a powerful influence on the ability for us to heal. And we ha so. actually have somebody very passionate and well-educated doing a lot of research and um, an interaction with people. And he's here with us today. I'd like to welcome Bob. Well, we're very fortunate to have a young Renaissance man, <laughs> uh, Chaplain Robert Bergner, who has a remarkable background and very innovative in American medicine and uh, healing today. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about his background and uh, how he got to where he is today. Bob graduated from one of the great colleges in the world, Millbury College, where he majored in dance, music, video, drama, theater, song composition, basically all the arts, you know, he engulfed. He went on for a diploma at uh, one of the great universities in the world, McGill in Montreal in uh, the Cons Music Conservatory. But he had a spiritual dimension too. He stayed at McGill and developed a master's degree in theology and became an Episcopalian priest, where he ministers, interfaith ministry in hospitals, clinics, prisoners, prisoners BA, uh, in some of the most uh, sensitive situations in life, life and death, family consultations. But he took that music career too, and this is how I got to meet uh, Robert at Yale New Haven Hospital. I kept hearing things about him. You know, he was in the music therapy program, and he's the guy who they sent into the psych wards at Yale. He's the guy in the ICU units, in the cancer wards, in the emergency rooms. And when I heard remarkable things about he could walk into any room and within a matter of minutes, he had all these disassociated people singing joyously and changed the whole outcome and atmosphere of a clinic and a floor, not just for the patients, but the families, and also for the doctors and nurses. So I'd like to really welcome Chaplain Robert Bergner, and thank Yay. you for being here. Thank you, Pat. Welcome, Bob. Uh, my, <laughs> my question with your background, how did you become Bob Bergner? How did you take this confluence of spirituality and music and bring it to where you are today? Well, first of all, Patrick, let me say, you make me sound like a really great guy, so <laughs> I'll try to live up to that. Uh, well, I think it probably goes back decades, actually, um, even as far back as just me for myself, sort of modulating and regulating my own moods by picking up my guitar or putting on the radio and listening to a favorite Rolling Stones song or something. So noticing that in myself, and then from there sort of wondering, how this might apply to other people as well. I actually remember a friend of my parents who was, had a diagnosis of some kind of terminal cancer and he was over at my parents' house and I happened to be there as well practicing the piano. And I remember just practicing some Mozart and how he was sitting in the, at the other end of the room just obviously listening very intently and him saying to me afterwards how much he had appreciated that. Wow. And that was sort of like a little light bulb that went off. Like, this is, wow, this is a really valuable not just a valuable skill, but that it has applications so far beyond whether or not you know I become a great concert pianist mm -hmm. or whatever aspiration I had at the time. So that kind of flowed through, and then in my prison chaplaincy and hospital chaplaincy work, um, noticing then with other groups of people, with other 
um, health challenges and obviously behavioral challenges, the effect that music had. So I remember one Christmas, I was in Quebec at the time, and we had a big Christmas church service for all the inmates at a maximum security prison. And I was encouraged by one of the chaplains, the other chaplains, to lead this entire probably 200 young men, probably not all young men, but young men in the prison, uh, men in the prison, to lead them in the song. So I wrote up a little, har I wrote up harmony parts, and I taught them on the spot. Like, we ended up singing four-part harmony. Wow. It was an amazing experience. So 200 guys in a maximum wow. security prison singing in four-part harmony, on the, just like that, within wow. five minutes. So that sort of thing, and then working in a hospital and working with people living with Alzheimer's and dementia, again in Quebec, and there's a whole corpus of traditional Quebec songs that everybody in a certain generation knows. And I would go in the hospital, and I'd bring pictures related to the songs, and we'd hand out the pictures, and people would pick a picture that was related to whichever song, and then we'd sing the song together. Wow. And it was amazing. People hadn't talked in weeks. All of a sudden, we're singing. People started dancing. That's amazing. So those kind of things, <laughs> and they've just carried through. So then I was working at Yale New Haven, where you ran into me or heard about me. And... I was working as a chaplain and going, bringing my guitar around, and again, working with patients with all sorts of different disparate illnesses, um, and noticing the response that I got. People at end of life, playing for their families, for the staff, and the kind of transformative event that happened. And then finally, after doing that for a couple of years, the psych hospital at Yale got wind of this and said, can't you send that guy over <laughs> to the psych hospital? Is that Fernanda, who, Fernanda Clariana? Yeah, so Fernanda was one who, yeah. after I was done working there as a chaplain, she invited me to stay on as a volunteer. Yeah, she's the coordinator at Yale New Haven Hospital and does a lot of the musical therapies and doing a right, remarkable job therapies. there with holistic therapies. It's amazing what she's yeah. doing. Yeah. And so can I just ask a question? Yeah. So music in the um, hospital environment is re being reintroduced, but it goes back much further than that. So Absolutely. What, what are the roots? So where, how far back do they go? <laughs> well, as far, <laughs> pretty much as far back as we know. Um, yeah, so what we're doing is nothing new, and the, the transformations and healing that takes place with the music we're doing now is, would not have been new to the Greeks 2,500 years ago. So, in fact, a lot of the research that the Greeks were doing into music and harmony, so Pythagoras and his, his students, which run right into Plato and Aristotle, so they were doing research on musical scales and musical relations, and then applying it, and this was actually their intent. They weren't just trying to, they weren't just paving the way for Mozart to come along. Right. They were actually intending to discover what scales and what musical relationships had what effect on people's body, mind, and soul. So they were actually developing a whole science of musical sound and musical therapy, and that was true throughout the world, actually. So in South Asia, for example, they have a whole science of musical sound and the effect it has on people's mental state and physical health. So the whole mantra thing, right. the mantra thing with the yoga practice. Yeah, I was, you know, when you talk about the Greeks, they had the healing sanctuary called Epidaurus, which uh, Plato talked about, Hippocrates, and they would, one of the therapies, I mean, they used mu music therapy, vibrational therapy, where they would alternate the harp mm -hmm. and the flute, you know, and synchronize it somehow, but alternating it to create certain vibrations to treat specific kinds of diseases. So the doctors then would actually be giving a prescription pad out for different mm. kinds of music interventions based on the illness and disease. Remarkable. It is remarkable. And they would even have at this healing sanctuary to combine that, these little marble stellas, which had mantras, you know, positive reinforcement. And they had the patients walk around at different times of the day and actually reinforce those thoughts, and then go back into a healing circles mm. of music. You know, so it was very sophisticated, mm -hmm. their knowledge, their holistic approach. And it was, there was also yeah. David with Saul, right? Yeah. Playing right, so for, for a biblical his... story, and we don't know if it's an apocryphal story, <laughs> if it really happened, but it does reflect sort of the, the cultural attitudes of the time. So the story of David, Saul having some sort of mental dysfunction, and David there comes and, and plays his heart. There he is, yeah, doesn't he look... Uh, Yep, He's a little sad, a little, to right, struggling, and David's <laughs> playing his liar. And according to the Bible, anyway, it works. And every time Saul is in one of these fits of depression, David comes in and plays his Now, liar. is that the harp he's playing? I believe that is actually, you're probably right. It's yeah. a harp. It's interesting about the harp because I see it at the hospital, and it's, uh, 
It's an instrument that has, what, 20 to 50 chords, and they're yep. open. Unlike a violin, they're open. Right, there's, there's no resonating. There's no chamber. resonating, and they've discovered that all those vibrations go, oh, out, go out and like have... a wave right into the room. And they go, and, and actually right into all the cells of the body right. and the different organs, and it has a remarkable effect. Mm -hmm. So Our, maybe that's how we started with the World War one and two music therapy yeah. on set. Was people coming by with their harps to play for soldiers? <laughs> <laughs> Was it harps they used? I think they might have been or? using harps. I'm, I'm vaguely remembering that harps were involved. But particularly singing was involved. There's actually a woman who was called the woman who sings away shell shock. So shell shock was the, the shock oh, was World so War One name for post, basically post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. So there's an operation song that they have developed from mm -hmm. music therapy with, there you go. The, the, right, now for, there's for veterans. more, Is more that for interactive veterans, or, veterans right? program. Right, so there are actually several programs. There's a Guitars for Vets program where people give out guitars to veterans and teach them how to play them. Wow. And then, it, interesting, sort of on a, maybe on a darker side, but still people expressing themselves with music. So some veterans have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan and made music videos that they've written themselves and produced. And they're, some of them are quite shocking, but <laughs> boy, you sure get a feeling of what they're going through yeah. and the struggles that they're going through. Interesting. Yeah. And you also worked with post-traumatic stress. Well, actually, that's what I'm working on right now. So for my master's thesis, we're hopefully, if everything goes smoothly, we're doing a... This is at Harvard, right? This is through Harvard, through Harvard. right, through the um, psychology department. So doing a, well, it's actually, interestingly enough, it's a Yale-Harvard matchup. Oh, wow. Because my neighbor is a psychologist at the Veterans Hospital in West Haven and a professor at, at Yale. And so he invited me to come in and do a music project with some of the female veterans living with PTSD, so we're very excited. Maybe we should take a look at a video you brought with you so we could see what you're doing interactively also in your community care program. Well, that would be great. So I'm also working. Uh, uh, at a life care community, uh, and these are some of the people that I work with. And they are the metal know. arcs, the marvelous metal arcs. Yes. So Jeff and Bob has been coming here for a year. Mm -hmm. And since then, before he was coming to do predominantly spiritual services on the weekend, which always um, introduce a musical, like a hymn singing component. But um, because of his multitude of talents and the, all his musical instruments that he plays, he had asked if he could come and do music appreciation. What I've been profoundly impressed about is all of our schooling and knowledge about dementia has been predominantly about the fact that people that with Alzheimer's and memory loss cannot form new relationships that have a difficult time retaining new information um, and that aren't really able to capitalize on anything they've learned in the short term. And what I've observed here from our residents, the 58 folks that live here, is that they, they're learning songs and singing songs that are not standards. They're not just hymns. There are some Jewish songs he's taught them, songs in another language, like um, I think they sing La Bamba, which is a part Latin influence. And these are not necessarily songs that they would pick up on. That was great. Thanks so much yeah, for bringing that welcome. along. Thank you for showing that. So I just want to kind of echo and expand some of what Emily said. So she was the director of this particular residence. So yeah, there's a lot of evidence now growing that music can reach people with Alzheimer's and dementia in a way that other interventions can't. So maybe some of us have seen the movie Alive Inside where people are given an individual uh, individualized iPod with headphones and they 
even if they haven't spoken or communicated in any way in months or even years, I think, all of a sudden they start singing along with their music and even smiling. Even in vegetative laughing. states, right? I they're believe, a, yes, from they're what even I've able read. to. Amazing. Right, amazing what can and how, happen. It's such a simple way to get through and into and permeate the human soul. It's just fantastic. I guess, I guess scientists are finding that you, know, you can have someone with Alzheimer's, somebody almost in that vegetative state, but that there are music plays almost, it's almost as if it goes into different parts of the brain, different circuits of the right. brain. You know, that. Uh, well, it does seem that way, for example, and then I'm going to make you tell your story about vegetative states or <laughs> oh, coma. Oh, okay. <laughs> But, for example, the, the distinctions between musical language associated with music and language associated with just language. So people who have strokes or traumatic brain injury who lose the function in their uh, language centers, so they're not able to speak, but yet they're able to sing lyrics. So not unlike the Alzheimer's folks living with Alzheimer's who maybe aren't communicating in a verbal way, but as soon as you start playing a song that they know, they can remember they're, and sing. They're singing along. And this is the amazing thing, as Emily had mentioned in the video, what we did was to bring in songs that they had never heard, and we know they hadn't heard them because I had written them, <laughs> and songs in other languages than <laughs> English, which we also know that they didn't know. And the amazing thing was they could learn those too. And some people actually memorized lyrics from my own songs that they had never heard before. Amazing. And we were able to sing along. You know, uh, when I was in Iceland learning Icelandic, my mother-in-law said, why don't we start you with songs? Learn the songs, then you'll learn the words. And I found that it was like so much more. Uh, it was a powerful way to access, and I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to turn my brain on and go into it. So there's got to be. Right. That's the beautiful way around it. And so natural. It's really natural to just. And that's a good point for, I mean, there are a lot of people out there who are caretakers. You know, we've been caretakers of uh, elderly and who may have lost some of their faculties. But uh, not to give up that. Music, lyrics, song, songs, and all of these uh, type of interventions can be a way to bring people back and actually have them socialize more and communicate. And you wanted me to... Yeah, tell your, tell your story. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> tell okay. your story about it. There's a video out there called 48 Hours to Live on YouTube. I did an NPR show on it. But the part of the video shows, and my experience is when my mom was in Yale New Haven Hospital, the medical intensive care unit, given only two days to live. but. She, she went on to live 12 years. We did a lot of interventions. But one of the things we used was she was in a coma, you know, induced coma, morphine-induced coma because of her respiratory condition. Mm -hmm. So I noticed when I went to visit her, all the nurses would be talking to her, even though she's in a coma. Hello, Mrs. Moore. Hi, Mrs. Moore. Yeah. How are you today? And everything like that. And I started asking them, do you think my mom's in a coma? Can she really hear you? So they said, we think that patients, we don't take anything for granted. These are veteran ICU nurses. We think they can hear. So in that case, I started putting, you know, all pictures of her dog on the wall so the nurse, you know, all her children, so the nurses can relate to those names and then talk to my mom. And then I did something else. I said, well, let me use music therapy. I know my mom loved Rodgers and Hammerstein, Sound of Music, Oklahoma, you know, South Pacific and everything. So an hour in the morning, I would put earphones and play music to her. And I do that an hour in the afternoon. And in the evening, I gave an hour of this subliminal alpha waves type healing music. So she had three music, three hours a day of music therapy, of listening. And uh, I, think it, I think it went through. I mm -hmm. think it actually helped. The did healing. she have any recollection of that afterwards? I yeah, think she I did. I love that music you played I think she me. did. You know, I think the one singing in the rain with Gene Kelly yeah. <laughs> and nice. a couple of Frank Sinatra's, you know. That'll <laughs> bring it right that out. Too. So it's amazing what, the, uh, what we don't know and that uh, how what you're doing I mean, you're involved with a lot of different health applications, right, mm -hmm. in the hospital. I mean, Alzheimer's and stroke and... Post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress, tra traumatic brain injury, Parkinson's. I've done some work with Parkinson's folks as well. So the importance there apparently being, well, A, that they just enjoy the music. So this is both in a dance context and a singing context. Oh, interesting. So just increasing mood, just giving them something to look forward to during the day. Oh, we're going to go to the singing group. We're going to go to the dancing group but also the effects of rhythm in particular on motor function. So people who are unable to, for example, doing, they're doing the stuttering thing with their feet when they can't get moving, but if they have a rhythmic pulse to work with, then they're able to move in almost, a organized, normally? almost normally. Amazing. In fact, even more than normally in some cases. Really? So there's, there's actually, a, there are probably several dance groups around the world, but in particular there's a group in New York City 
the Brooklyn Parkinson's group. So they started out, they work with the Mark Morris Dance Company, and they have regular dance classes for people living with Parkinson's disease, and they do amazing things. That's fantastic. People just basically start dancing. Who could bear, you think, well, that person can barely move. And then they dance, and even, the wonderful thing is, even the people who still can't dance in what we would think of as a flowing, dancey manner, their solutions to the dance assignments that are given, like, okay, we're all going to walk across the floor and wave our arms like a bird. Well, even if they can't really walk that well and they can't quite do the fluid arm movement, still the solutions are so compelling and, and beautiful. It's a wonderful experience for them. So, so, you know, the more we know in the future, I can see the prescription pad coming out here. Okay, you take this medication, you get what, eat this food, but I want you to, when we have experts like you, implement a musical therapy program. And pain and anxiety. Pain, and, pain anxiety. and anxiety in yeah. the hospitals, aren't they even in the... Absolutely, in the operating theater. Yeah. Absolutely, that, that it has, I'd say at this point. So some of the research has yet to be done, and some of this, there's not quite as robust a research behind some of these interventions yet. And there they are right there. But certainly the pain and anxiety is one of the things that has been studied so well that there's no doubt that musical interventions, even during operative proced surgical procedures, has a positive effect, lowers the amount of medication that needs to be given to patients, lowers their preoperative anxiety, postoperative anxiety. So yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Spirits go up. I've seen blood pressure normalize. Blood pressure Pulse goes down. Pulse yeah. down. Absolutely. And uh, healing time. Can, you know, I believe can healing time is faster. Time. Accelerated, yeah. yes. Uh, it's remarkable. It affects all our hormones in many respects. I'm reading it raises our what's called dopamine levels, serotonin levels. And speaking of which, acids. don't forget oxytocin. Oxytocin, yeah. Yeah, love the, the love, the love hormone, the and love. the vagus nerve. When you mentioned that, that's right. Talk so about the vagus nerve. There's a whole world <laughs> about the vagabond nerve. nerve. The vagabond, the vagabond nerve. nerve. Why do they call it the vagabond nerve? Well, they call it the vagabond mm. nerve because it goes everywhere <laughs> inside of your body. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, they inside don't. of this center part of your body. So, and there's a good. Diagram for Thank us you, too. right? The vagus nerve going into all of those internal organs. So we often think, I've noticed this, and this was my own concept too, that we think of the nervous system and everyone thinks, oh, the brain and the spinal column and all the skeletal nerves, right? That's your nervous system. Yeah. But there's this whole other amazing complex of nerves that actually connects all of your internal organs and interestingly also operates to the largest extent your voice um, vocal capacity. So, you know, we, we, it also, the vagus nerve, in our last show, we talked about the microbiome and the 100 trillion bacteria, and the vagus nerve connects the enteric nervous system with the central nervous system. And I wonder if this music is getting these 100 trillion bacteria to jump up and dance. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying why to visualize, not? get yep, happy. Marching well, right up there. Marching around and say, I'm going to get better. GABA. Well, happy. it's because it's also connected to parts of your ear. Yeah, yeah it's stimulating it's this entire connected. system. It's amazing. It really is amazing. And just to put, because my favorite interview, intervention is a singing intervention, so there, there is actually a branch of the vagus nerve that there are two, two sets that are particularly active in your vocal apparatus, and one goes directly there from your brain, but one actually wraps down around your heart, around your aorta, just at the level of your heart, and then come before it connects, before or after, depending on which way you look at it, connects with your larynx. So actually, to say that you're speaking from your heart or singing from your heart actually it's true. It's is all not just a phrase, just That's an beautiful. aphorism. And interestingly, perhaps overwhelming, <laughs> interestingly, about the vagus nerve, since you mentioned it. So 80% of the nerve signal, you know, nerves have signals going both directions, nerves going out and nerves coming back to the brain. 80% of the nerve signals of the vagus nerve are actually going brainward. So wow. it's actually your belly. Yeah, and that's, that's what informing we just your spoke brain. Well, last yeah, we talked were... about that. We think the brain, uh, it's going this way, but most of the communications were coming right. from our gut, and that's when we say we feel butterflies, Absolutely. goosebumps, right. all these different things. I have a gut feeling. All right. from the vagus nerve. So wow. moving right along, because we have a little special thing we want to share today. <laughs> what about yeah. musical ideas? How can people out in the audience research or, re or um, find ways to follow a musical path that works for them for their wellness and not to be singing well but to be singing or humming to feel well absolutely singing to feel well I like that <laughs> um, yeah well there are lots of different interventions some quite simple so this would be for personal health as I said I used music for my own um, emotional regulation when I was younger and I actually still do it 
um, and also as caregivers. So just yeah. singing simple songs with, so if, if I'm caring for Patrick, oh, yeah, thank you, you know, I can no, sing a simple song with him. Maybe we can just hum together if we're not sure we feel comfortable singing, which certainly happens that people have been convinced that they don't know how to sing. Um, or are nervous. And or are nervous about singing. Yeah. Um, so you and brought then your singing trio with you today. We do have a wonderful singing trio. Well, I'd like to introduce my daughter, Carlina Moore. Hi. <laughs> All right. And we have a good friend of mine, Joel Kalevsky, over here. Say hello, Joel. Hello, everybody. And don't forget, introducing, do you have a name for your guitar? You know, I don't have a name. Oh, maybe oh, you could come up with bad. one. Oh, that's too bad. Call it the, the Vegas. I'll call it the Vegas Nerve. That's the Vegas Nerve. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, Vegas. Yeah, the Vegas. I'm going, going to Vegas. Vegas. <laughs> going to Las Vegas. Going to Las Vegas. Bob Vegas guitar. There you go, going to Bob Vegas. There you go. So, and there's lots of resources on the internet as well, talking about different formalized programs that people have put together yeah. to encourage just this sort of thing, this yes. sort of gathering together, community, community and um, raising that vibration, raising our mood and our <laughs> vibration. Get the Vegas nerve going, get, right? Get the we Vegas that, nerve, uh, yeah. Okay, so let's Oxy hear it. Let's so here's what we're going to do. We are going to sing a song together, and we're going to start actually by humming it, speaking of getting our Vegas nerve going, just so we all feel comfortable, okay. and we don't have to, we'll just work our way into the song. I think everyone's going to recognize this song. And then we're going to sing the lyrics. Let's Wonderful. go. And That's good. if you all want to sing with us, that'll be great. Um, this is a worldwide community, a worldwide singing community. So Wonderful. we'll start with the humming. Song to the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay, yeah. pleasure to be here. Thanks for singing. Thank you,